When dawn lands at the Naval Air Station, Patuxent River, on this steamy July morning, Chris Rao is already in hiding. It went about 10 yards off the beach, not too far from my position. From his vantage point atop a sandy cliff on the shore of the Patuxent River, he zeroes in on his target, a female diamondback terrapin. Actually, well, there's two together out there. Really, what you, you see with the terrapins when they're in the water is the head, especially when they're looking at a beach deciding when they're going to nest. They seem to keep their heads up out of the water quite a bit. Then they will pull their heads back down under the water, and then we don't really know where they're going to show up. When a female decides she's ready to nest, she makes a beeline from the water to the shore. Terrapins seem to love this spot in particular, a remote beach surrounded by marsh and forest that also happens to be home to one of the Navy's helicopter landing zones. So each summer, nesting season, helicopters land elsewhere, all to accommodate Maryland's state reptile. That's when Chris, an assistant professor at the University of Maryland's Chesapeake Biological Laboratory, just across the river in Solomon's Island, returns to study these terrapins. We are examining how diamondback terrapins are responding to the changing climate. We're looking forward and trying to project how they'll respond to climate change in the future, but we're also trying to get a handle on what's happening with the populations now because climate change is is happening as we speak. One question Chris wants to answer, how will sea level rise impact the terrapins' habitat? It's an important one because terrapins, unlike other turtles, are uniquely adapted to life in brackish or slightly salty environments, like the marshes in and around the Chesapeake Bay. We don't see terrapins in the sea, in the open ocean. We don't see them in the fresh waters. They're restricted to this brackish environment because they've specialized for it. In Maryland, half of the terrapin's current nesting ground is expected to be underwater in the next 30 years. By the end of the century, more than three quarters will be claimed by the tides. But it's not just sea level rise that threatens the terrapin's reproduction. Like many other turtles, a terrapin's sex is determined by the temperature of the nest during the incubation period. In simple terms, the hotter it gets, the more females will hatch. One of the things that we're concerned about is as it gets warmer, we're going to see a, an excess of females and a much lower abundance of males. Chris wants to know more about the factors that influence the sex of the embryo. And for that, he needs to link the mothers to their nests, which is why he waits and waits to catch nesting females in the act. There's nothing more frustrating than a close call. While Chris waits, Rebecca Stump, a natural resource specialist with the Navy, combs the beach, searching the sand for signs. I'm looking for terrapin tracks. Consistently, they come up out of the water they're gonna crawl up, find a spot, lay, and turn around. So we're looking for entry tracks and we're looking for return tracks. Nothing yet, but she's already found one nest today. So this particular nest was laid earlier today and I just threw a predator exclusion device, a pet over it. But we're gonna go ahead and move it a little bit further up so that if we have any major storms, it's not completely inundated. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull back the sand gently until I see the first egg. Hopefully they're still pink, which indicates a fresh egg. After several hours, they start to turn white and we call that chalking. At that point, simply turning the egg the wrong way could kill it. I've come to the top of the first egg and they are still kind of pink, so they're good. Rebecca runs the Air Station's Diamondback Terrapin Nest Monitoring Program. The goal is to find and protect as many nests as possible. 
This is the 66th nest this year. I have a couple of tools that I use. Rebecca carefully weighs and measures each egg. I have a pair of calipers that go down to millimeters. Actually, it goes down to tenths of millimeters. Recording data that will be shared with Chris and other researchers. That's a ginormous egg, way outside the average size. Well, these all are. Female terrapins rarely come ashore except to nest once, maybe twice each summer. The turtles here seem to wait until right around Independence Day to lay their eggs. It's a busy time for Rebecca and her team. All right, for the last step, after we've weighed and measured all the eggs, I'm gonna go ahead and cover up the nest. And now, perhaps the most important part, a black milk crate fashioned with a protective mesh is what Rebecca and her colleagues call a predator exclusion device, or a PED. All right, the nest is pretty secure. If I can't wiggle it, then a predator's highly unlikely to get in here. The only clue a mother leaves behind after she covers her nest is her scent, which lingers for a day, beckoning to coyotes, foxes, and skunks. Those predators that get lucky leave little behind, beyond an empty hole and a few eggshells. This program started in 2013, and that first year, we didn't really make a big effort to protect the nests. We had like a 90% predation level when without protecting them. These days, predators rarely get a nest. Back at Chris's end of the beach, it's been a disappointing morning. Today, we didn't do very well. In other words, we didn't get anything. But that's how it goes, and that's why we spend so much time out here, is it's a waiting game. Although Chris didn't catch any females today, he did find a nest that he'll take back to the lab to incubate and hatch. These eggs were collected either from freshly laid nests in the field, or they were collected from females who we caught who were carrying their eggs and hadn't nested yet. And we brought them into the lab and had them lay their eggs for us in here. Each one of these containers is a different nest or clutch. They'll be incubated at different temperatures, all part of an effort to establish a baseline understanding of how temperature affects the sex of the hatchlings. The long-term goal is to be able to project roughly what the sex ratios in the future might be. Nearly two months later, the eggs in Chris's lab begin to emerge. This is a hatchling diamondback terrapin. This animal hatched about three days ago. Still very tiny, as you can see, and the shell is still a little bit flexible. If I turn it over, you see on the belly, this is called the plastron, and in the middle of the plastron, you see that yellow mark. That's where the yolk sac was when it hatched. So when this animal actually came out of the egg, it still had some yolk in a little bubble there on its belly. And over the next day, it fed off of that yolk, and now it's all gone. Chris puts a notch on each shell and tattoos a unique number on the plastron. Check. That will help him identify them in case they ever cross paths again. We've got these animals back at their nesting site. We're gonna take them about a half a mile up the beach to where the nest was actually located, and then we'll give them the first taste of freedom. And if the web of tiny tracks crisscrossing the sand is any indication, Chris's terrapins will be in good company. There are a couple sets of tracks right there. This is a nest that has eluded both Rebecca's group and, and my group, and it's, it's fortunate that 
that it, it also eluded the predators. Speaking of Rebecca, she too is on the beach early this morning. When the eggs start to hatch, she and her volunteers check the nests twice a day. Oh, we've got babies. I count 11 on the surface. Oh, this is good. So I'm gonna pull this up real quick. I'm gonna shake it. Oh, see, I got some hanger honors. Yep, there's another one right here. He's stuck up in here. Okay, make sure there's no more in here. And then I'm gonna scoop them up. Oh, this one's already going under. One, two, three, four, five, six. Rebecca's records show 15 eggs were in this nest, but there are only 11 hatchlings. Before she goes further, she needs to account for them all. And what I found was a whole bunch of ants. And I dug further, and first thing I found was a pink egg. So this egg never started development. We have a almost fully developed baby turtle that for some reason ants got into it. It's tough to be a terrapin, even with Rebecca's help. The next step is to weigh and measure each youngster. Be still. The difference between babies and a nest can be pretty drastic. That's because a single nest can have genetic material from multiple fathers. Once the data is collected, it's time to let the babies go. All right, we're gonna release these guys right at the edge of this grassy area leading to a marsh so they can kind of choose where they wanna go. For years, it was thought terrapin hatchlings, like sea turtles, head straight for the water. But now, scientists believe most of them spend their first year on land, living in the forest or the marsh grass. They take a moment to get their bearings, and before long, they're gone. The time has come for Chris, too, to say goodbye to his hatchlings. So this is the part where we wish them the best and introduce them to Mother Nature. I hope she treats you well, little ones. And with that, they're off, taking their first steps into a world that some will not survive but some will. And when they return to nest, the cycle will begin once again.